us in the conversation as about Friar Paramile Khubi Majola Siabulela Mama as well as Dr. Christy Felyun. And we are talking, of course, what approach should government be taking policy wise uh, when it comes to the budget, which is now only a month away uh, before it is presented by a treasury. Before the break uh, in transmission, we were, of course, looking at the issue of the basic income grant and how that should be approached. Dr. Christy, uh, weighing on what your th thinking is here around. The, the, the spending on the social uh, wage, uh, uh, particularly with a view that Treasury is saying 27.8 million uh, South Africans on social grants, it's 1.1 trillion in 2021-2022, quite high. And there's been th thinking around whether or not uh, the, the, the current grants, various grants that exist, should all be replaced by one basic income grant or whether we should go and borrow uh, to fund the basic income grant or uh, certainly taxpayers uh, should be footing the bill or maybe a combination of all the three. These are some of the questions that's being thrown around and behind closed doors and open forums, it's, it's, it's a hot topic uh, because there are so many angles to it. So we look ahead at the budget speech where the finance minister uh, needs to make decisions on how money is being spent. I think often people expect the budget speech to solve lots of problems in South Africa. The bottom line is that it's actually about how money is going to be spent. And one of the key items on the agenda this year is this basic income grant or whatever shape or form it might take. First prize is always if you can help someone create or find a job. That's, that's first prize. But because we haven't been able to do it, because we are sitting with this socioeconomic challenge in our country of, of inequality and poverty, uh, this is the next step. Uh, and there's enough research to support it. Now, the question is, what does it look like? How much is it going to be? Who's going to get it? Uh, I think the... The one idea about making or reducing the amount of grants that are currently being paid in favor of this kind of universal grant is certainly gaining traction. Uh, but then again, is it going to cost more? It's probably going to cost more than it is at the moment in terms of social grants. And then the question is, where does the money come from? And that's where, why the finance minister's speech is so important, if he can give us details. Because the question is, are we going to take that money away from where government is already spending something and, and divert it? Or do we get that money from somewhere else? Because then the question is, where do we get this from? And immediately, red flags come up. People think, okay, now taxes are going to go up. Maybe VAT goes up. Maybe personal income tax. It's one of the ways of getting that money. And then, yes, the idea of borrowing it. Uh, we could go borrow money to do this. But if you borrow money today, you have to pay it back at some mm. stage. And actually, it's going, to be, it's going to be our children that will have to pay it back. Mm. At the moment, there's a big chunk of South Africa's fiscal budget going to interest rate payments because we borrowed money five years ago, ten years ago to help fund the government. So it's not just the case of what this grant should look like and who should it go to. It's that very tricky question about how do we get the money. We currently have a big budget deficit. It basically means that we are already spending more in terms of public expenditure than what the government is getting in. So beyond needing to narrow that gap, now we would probably need to find more money for the social spending. And that's what the finance minister will at least need to give us some signals on. I don't think he's going to have the answers in the next few weeks. I don't think there's going to be a solution yet, but he's going to have to show us some progress so that we can at least yeah. plan ahead on what's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, of course, the, the demands and the needs are immediate. I mean, if you look at uh, the situation of these African households uh, and what uh, they are spending now and the money that they're getting, it really does not uh, add up. And uh, what is feasible, in your view, within the, the current parameters uh, when it comes to this question of uh, the basic uh, income grant? Um, well, tax the rich um, introduced a progressive wealth tax. And there has been a comprehensive um, study on this, which found that if you tax between 3% and 7, to 7% 7 of the rich, 165 billion could, could be earned from this. In South Africa, currently we have profit shifting, illicit financial flows of over that's costing the economy 300 billion. That's where the money could come from to find a, a basic income grant. Um, and, and, and we've been pointing to this. Currently, there's a case between AMCU um, and, 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 and Lonmin that Lonmin is shifting away profits of 45 
billion rand. That is the money that could be used for social spending. That's the money that would be used for a basic income grant of 1,500 that we've been calling for. I mean, Isabel said it, that over 10 million people in South Africa go to bed hungry. Three million people are children. They go to bed hungry every week. Um, there needs to be a shift. And as the Assembly of the Unemployed, we have been warning about this. We have been warning that the, the, the public sector wage free, the, the freeze in, in, in employment in the public sector, um, the, 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 the cuts in government funding will lead to greater levels of joblessness yeah. um, and this to greater levels of inequality. And, and that's currently what we're seeing. Um, and for this, this could be shifted. I mean, over 2 million workers have lost their job over this um, two, two, two year um, period. So we need to tax the rich. Yeah. Um, and that's where we could get 165 billion that could fund a basic income grant of um, 1,500 that we're calling for. And we're expecting Treasury to look into these things. Um, and there's also an easier option, by the way, um, which government could, could borrow money from itself. Um, there's under 2 trillion that sits in, in accumulated reserve within the, the GEPF. Workers are contributing 6% every month to that money. So government could borrow at um, a less than market um, level rate. Yeah. And this, in this way, they could consolidate their debt, which is the main reason for austerity, which we have been warning against. I'll come back to that as well as uh, the, the budget cuts. But Paramile, how does the uh, finance minister strike a balance here between the, the competing national spending priorities, considering uh, the, the, the current fiscal framework? Where, where should he be getting the money to fund the, the basic income grant? Oh, we seem to have lost Pagamile there. I thought she was, she was still there. All right, uh, we'll try and get her back, 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 back on. So, well, thank you very much for your patience as well. I see you nodding your head very ferociously there uh, as uh, 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 Siabulela raises the issue of the uh, just below 2 trillion rands of, of the money sitting at the PIC. I was having a conversation yesterday with Dr. Pari Lohotla. I don't know what the debate is, but he seems to think that um, uh, the... Uh, international investors will be offended, I suppose, if we, we borrow from ourselves. And this is the reason uh, why we have not uh, pursued that, uh, that particular line. I mean, what, what, is, what, is, what, what is what you know and what is your thinking as to why this has not been done? Thanks, Tavo. I, I, I think that it, this kind of debate is really helpful because we start to identify solutions and areas in which we can find uh, additional give. I think that the one thing that is clear from, from our research um, and our perspective is that we can't actually borrow from other, we can't take from other government spending, that the austerity budget has been so slashed that government will cease to function in many of the critical line departments which we've seen if they are squeezed any further. So the, the idea of looking for other solutions and other sources is really important. Um, Paddy, I, I had a conversation with him on Thursday, and he's done a lot of work on the scenarios in which they've planned different areas in which money can be sourced. I think it's important to add um, that last week, civil society had a really positive meeting with the president um, and the ministers of social development as well as finance were there. And the question that we raised was, how can we extend the social relief of distress and how can we source and fund a basic income grant? I think what you were saying earlier is correct, and it's good to see um, our comrade from the private sector nodding as well on this, is that there, something has to be done, and something has to be done quite drastically. The point about the PIC, which is important to note, is that it is one of up to 11 alternative sources of funding that have been identified. The other thing that I wanted to say was research that we, uh, that SPI published at the end of last year, done by Duma Kovule, as well as work recently done by the UN, the ILO, has identified the question of the multiplier as being quite crucial and something that's often left out of this discussion. The multiplier is basically the question of how many times government spend per rand can be circulated locally in order to generate further economic returns. So if poor, and poor communities are getting government grants going in, what are the micro policies that can be introduced in order to capture that money 
to enable people to start their own ventures. And that comes back to the, the sort of framing question about unemployment. We know, as, as Chris um, was saying from PwC, that, that the jobs that were created are no longer there. We need to look at those sectors of the economy, as Siwa was saying, uh, the ones that have closed down, as well as the illicit transfer pricing and the ways in which profits that are being generated are being shifted up before the tax can come to us. So I think rather than walking away and saying nothing can be done, we need to really sit down and say, these are the things that are needed. No one in South Africa should go to bed hungry. Yeah. Uh, we can't be looking at education and saying, why are our kids not doing well? When we know that the cognitive development um, of a child who is malnourished will never meet that of their peers who have, have three meals a day. So people are growing into a world where inequality is their legacy. We who have lived through the past inequalities of apartheid really have the burden to make sure that this doesn't happen. There is a crisis of unemployment. There is a crisis um, of poverty. Why, where are we in terms of, of sourcing the solutions to that? So the PIC is useful. Looking at the wealth tax, and in fact, um, SARS was, was given recommendations by uh, Judge Dennis Davis about how to start implementing ways of tracking the wealth. Because the thing about the wealth in South Africa is that historically, um, it, it's been protected from the kinds of tracking that, that we're looking at. So you can't tax what you can't find. But Thomas Piketty in his book, Capital, showed that the intergenerational transfer of wealth uh, can never be, can never ease itself. It has, something has to be done. So we need to track that wealth. We need to look at ways of redistributing it. Because I think that we all are aware, if we're really honest with ourselves, that living in the most unequal country in the world is going to end up in incredibly violent, volatile, and destructive yeah. models. And we don't want that. I mean, the question of taxing, uh, giving, taxing our children's children. Yeah. We don't want our children's children to be inheriting yeah. a country that is destroyed by our inability to make the tough decisions now. Uh, well, some are saying the, 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 the increase will just not be on the private sector. I know there is a suggestion that to, uh, you can move the, 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 the corporate tax from 27% to, to 30%, certainly suggested by, by Crusade, but there are some are saying uh, we are largely across the board going to see a 2% increase uh, in, in income tax. Is this uh, something that uh, households in South Africa can afford? Is that to me, Tabo? Yes, that's okay. Um, I think that we need to live up to reality, which is that uh, people who are earning sufficient to pay income tax are the privileged. Um, I think that a big concern that many have raised is an increase in VAT because the flat rate of VAT means that the poor disproportionately pay more. The question of the increase in, in, in a personal income tax would then lead taxpayers, I think, to start looking to government and say, if I'm paying personal income tax at that rate, why is it that I'm also paying private education? I'm trying to pay private health care. Where is the delivery that government needs to be doing to ensure that we're in the social, the, the, so seeking a social solution together? Those are really important questions because uh, there is no reason why the, the money that is allocated to these things is not spent. But to go back to your question, I think it would be unwise to start scaremongering I think that we need to be looking where the money can come from. Um, Sia gave some really good examples. I've been giving some examples. There are ways in which we can be cutting. Uh, I mean, the Government Employee Pension Fund, for instance, is a fully funded fund. Now, that means that it, it, it's really uh, contemplating the fact that every single government employee would need to be paid pension on the same yeah. day. Yeah. Basically, a GEPF is funded um, through the new people coming in and funding the old. So there are billions there. We're not saying go through and, and fleece what is there. We're saying, what is the structure? What do we need to have as a lump sum to start this? In terms of the multiplier, what are the returns that we can start generating over the next three to five years? Because with every round that is spent, um, generally in, in commerce, you get VAT coming back. So yeah. instead of, of looking at it narrowly, we need to be looking at how we open up opportunities. There is also the opportunity to, to, to look for kind of cross-funding that comes from other sources, uh, possibly to, to look at some investment from um, sort of longer-term right. government bonds. There are many, many solutions, but instead of that, we just get the scaremongering saying, well, it's going to affect me. We should be looking at how it's going to create 
ways in which we can feed everybody in this country. Dr. Christie, that's uh, one of the uh, uh, questions, of course, that come about. The, the question of the, if, if we, for example, um, get the, 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 the uh, social relief of distress grant continued, right? Uh, they are arguing, some economists, that, well, this will put more money into the economy and the government will be able to get more of that money. Is that something that will be sustainable or is it something that will, will catch up with us in the long run? Well, I think the important thing is, and it's been mentioned more than once now, it's that multiply effect. It, it basically means that who can spend a rand or 10 rand or 100 rand the most effective way? In, in, and that means how many jobs can we create when people spend money? Uh, so if we give more money to rural communities through this type of grant, uh, the expenditure will create jobs. The expenditure will create small businesses. If suddenly a whole village gets this kind of money every month, then some ent entrepreneur will jump up and he will create a new, a new service, a new shop. There will be certainly job creation, and that in turn creates more jobs. It creates more prosperity. So it is something that is uh, it's very valid. Apart from, from thinking of it as a, a social element, just in terms of pure economics of, of spending money, creating jobs, creating GDP, creating taxes. It is a way of, of supporting local economies. Uh, whether it is a responsibility of government to spend that money, whether you give it directly to a consumer, it again comes down to the, the, the decision on how will you uplift a community? How will you improve their socioeconomic situation? And uh, most often, it's a case of government is not able to be everywhere and to spend effectively everywhere and to do these interventions everywhere. In that case, it would be better to give that cash to a community of a 100 or a 1,000 people who then are able to spend that money in their community, creating those jobs that they actually need. Uh, and, and yes, we again we, we circle back often to where is the money coming from and as both the panelists said uh, we have many options uh, there are options that are popular there are options that are unpopular uh, there are, um, are locations of money that we can look to borrow that we can use yeah. um, i think the the big challenge now is that we need results now yeah. and and the there's, there's quick ways of getting this money, and there are ways that will take much longer. So, so how does the private sector feel, for example, while you're on that uh, note, sorry to jump in, about the, the fact that there, there are uh, many uh, organizations who believe that the private sector in this country is sitting on a whole lot of money, so they should be taxed a little bit more. But 3% would uh, not certainly harm their pockets. Is, is, is that a difficult conversation to have? It is a difficult conversation because the private sector is uh, responsible to their own shareholders. Now, these shareholders can be local, they can be international. At the same time, the private sector needs to be competitive against companies from the rest of the world. Um, that is, unfortunately, how it works for a country like ours, which is quite open, where we are dependent on exports and imports and foreign investment. Our companies need to be competitive. So they make decisions based on how they can be the most competitive, uh, and create the most production, create the most jobs, whatever the, their strategic goal might be. So the private sector is obviously looking at this from a perspective that uh, somewhere money needs to come from. And you can't completely ignore that there's a need for money to fund this kind of a basic income grant. Because on the other side, if you don't do it, then we sit like a situation at the moment where we have uh, social uncertainties in this country uh, boiling over. We know what happened in July last year uh, in, in KwaZulu-Natal, places of Gauteng, where we had social unrest that uh, some explained as political factors, some explained it as a different element. One of the key factors for many economists is just the fact that there were so many people in this country without a job that uh, need the opportunity or that want the opportunity to actually have more than they do at this stage. Uh, be able to, uh, as the other panelists said, not go to bed hungry. Yeah. Be able to have a better life for themselves and their children. So for the private sector, not necessarily just in South Africa, but in any country where there's talk about these kinds of grants or basic income transfers, it's that balance between looking after yourself, but also looking after your community. Because in the end, 
that's the community that, that supports you in terms of buying your goods and services or supplying you with the labor that you need or uh, mining the minerals that you actually put into the products that you make. Yeah. See, I mean, the, the real issue here, of course, is that these disparities are coming because of the high levels of unemployment. If you look at the broad definition, 48.9% and uh, youth unemployment, they're sitting at 74%. How, what should go into this budget that you think will immediately begin to, to address this issue? Because I, I suppose the discussion here regarding uh, employment is around economic growth. So if the decisions are correct, we will see economic growth and therefore uh, people will, will, be, will be employed in the economy of South Africa. Yes, um, and I think a very important point to make in this and a, a very important point to, to consider is the reason why we have unemployment is, is, is due to the problem of deindustrialization, which, have see, which we've seen through the introduction of neoliberal policies, where we've seen the financialization um, and, 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 and the change in the pattern of investment, by the way. Now, we're seeing investment shifting in, in, into the financial sector, shifting into the, to the mining sector, which are which are highly extractive. So to address this question, we have to think about how do we think about the issue of re-industrialization? Um, and there are examples, of course, which us as the Assembly of the Unemployed are also campaigning about. One million climate jobs, because as we face this issue of unemployment, we also face the issue of climate change. And we have made um, recommendations on how we, we, we re-industrialization could be enacted through the one million climate jobs campaign. Um, and, 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 and that's what we need. Um, and this could be led by, by government through um, a very specific initiatives which we've, we've mentioned before. And, 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 and one of them is um, stop profit shifting, stop illicit financial flow. Um, and that's where the money could be redirected. Um, and we don't need and you know the problem. Other problem is that we take money from the IMF and the World Bank, and yeah. taking money from the IMF and the World Bank means more austerity um, because um, they they get to dictate and recommend what we need to do, and that's the problem that we face, and that's the problem why we face the public um, sexual wage freeze now. That's why we're having that debate. So, stop taking money from 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 the IMF because they dictate what you do. So we need re-industrialization. And of course, we've seen the power of communities and self-organization yeah. um, and how communities through cooperatives in this time have been organizing themselves. Um, through, uh, so we, we must look into those issues um, and, 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 and that's how we can sort the problem of, of unemployment in some way. Of course, this must come with a shift in this um, structural setting of the economy. We'll talk more on that issue as well when uh, we come back. Thanks for staying with us tonight. You're on In Focus amongst the number of challenges that we are dealing with here uh, technically. But we'll take a break. As about Fry, Siabliela Mama, as well as Dr. Christopher Yoon staying with us. I will take your views as well. 072-110-5584. Tweet us tonight at Newsroom 405. The conversation continues. Thanks. Welcome back. Live tonight on In Focus, News of Africa, Channel 405. What should be the priorities of government spending? This as the finance minister is preparing to deliver his inaugural budget speech on the 23rd of February, weighing in as about Friar Siabliela Mama, as well as Dr. Christy Foyun. As about, let's go back to the question of uh, uh, cutting spending. For example, on police, the uh, annual report tabled in October indicating that uh, the SAPS were, were underspending uh, uh, their budget, right, by 2.6 billion if you're talking visible uh, policing uh, and 997 million if you're talking detectives. In real terms, that would mean that 11,000 fewer police officers and 2,000 less detectives that could have been in the system are currently not there. That indicates that maybe the problems are not really about money, that uh, there's something much broader that is happening there. I, I think that as we have these debates, it's important to keep in mind what we are discussing. So 
The, the issue of income support, income security as a way of generating or regenerating economic growth is important. The question of having the state uh, align and perform the, the tasks that it's meant to and to fill the vacancies that it's meant to is also critical. I think it's also really important to recognize, as Sia was saying earlier, in terms of the, the choices made by government um, in early days when we slashed the public sector wage bill, thinking that that would be a way to crowd in foreign direct investment and so grow the economy, has had ramifications. So to a large extent, many of the public servants who left haven't been replaced. So you've got a huge pressure. I know that when you look into the health, the, the public health care sector, for instance, the nurses that are there are incredibly overworked, are stretched. Uh, the level of care is really poor. And so you see in many hospitals because there just isn't enough staff. Yeah. So you have people pointing fingers and saying the level of care must improve without recognizing that people are being asked to perform absolutely monstrous tasks because they just don't get relief. Um, we need to look at the kinds of state investment that we need and how we bring that in. And rather than saying because people haven't spent or because we haven't filled these jobs, we're going to cut uh, the, the government allocation. If people are not spending their budget, because don't forget, budgeting is an incredibly um, complicated science, and it goes through iteration. So it's not a random sort of thumb such to say what needs to go there. It's done according to need to a certain extent. If that need is not being met and the money is not being spent, it means that there is a dysfunction in the system that needs to be addressed. But to take from that and to give it to income um, seems to be kind of supporting the idea of a tiny, a small state where uh, you give people money in the private sector is the one that decides then to provide the services for a profit, which then takes further money out. So I think the what we need to be aware of is firstly looking at income support, and that's really that's a, that's a big price, that's a big line item that we expect to see in the budget. We expect to see the state coming forward and say we commit to three years at least in the MTEF of the social relief of distress. What um, Chris raised earlier uh, in terms of the shape and, 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 and um, feel of something like a, a social grant uh, system is that we actually need to look at the amount of the grant. For 350 rand, we will all agree, is certainly not enough to meet your basic needs. If we are saying, can we use this grant to stimulate economic recovery by supporting local micro-entrepreneurs, it needs to be large enough to meet people's needs and also to give surplus so that you can start supporting your neighbor's ventures. Um, what we're doing right now is to trickle down in a very random manner and hope that some of that sticks. Now, that's not science. Um, that, that's, I, I'm not sure what you would call it apart from um, a, a very scary experiment. We need to be very clear about what we do. We need to look at the number of people who we need to cover um, and the amount so that we can start looking at those returns the, the research that was published last year shows that between three to five years, if you stagger a universal basic income grant, firstly at the food poverty line of 625, next year at the lower bound poverty line, and the following year at the upper bound poverty line, there's a way of kickstarting this economy in a way yeah. that none of the other programs that have been mentioned, yeah. um, debated, and um, adopted have been shown to do it yet. And we are running out of time. I think everybody on this panel accepts that. We need to start showing those interventions because uh, the, the, the concerns that we saw last July, we're coming up for another winter where people are cold and miserable. We need to give people the hope in order to ensure that tomorrow is better than today and it's their tomorrow yeah. which we're investing in. Uh, Chris, there's a sense and a concern from, from, from uh, some reports here that, that we are losing jobs in the semi-skilled category, sales and services in particular. Where are those jobs uh, going and why are we losing them? Yes, so, I mean, when we look at the labor data, we, we obviously look at it from an industry perspective, so manufacturing, agriculture, mining, but also there's a skills element to it. So you can, you can sort of segment it into uh, unskilled, semi-skilled, and skilled jobs. Uh, and what we've seen uh, now, the situation now versus before COVID-19, uh, we've lost about one in five semi-skilled jobs. Now, those are most often uh, in services industries, so retail, hospitality, for example, 
we know what the, the pain is that hospitality has felt over the past years. We know how especially small businesses in the services sector has struggled to survive. So we're seeing a, 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 a group of people, uh, like I say, basically classified as semi-skilled, that had full-time reliable jobs before COVID-19 that have subsequently lost them. Uh, and, and now it's maybe a case of maybe they've got something else. Maybe they've got a, a job that's paying less. Maybe they've got an informal job. Maybe they are underemployed, so as they're working fewer hours than they want. Yeah. Uh, it, it's got a knock-on effect on communities and on society where these people that actually were able to, in most cases, take care of their own finances that were not dependent on a, a transfer from the state. Many of those people are now highly dependent on the state, and it, it adds to the pressure that the other panelists have said so far in terms of people going to bed hungry, people that are unable to, to get or create a job for themselves. And these are the challenges we're sitting with now. So we're looking at the budget speech in a few weeks' time. Just before that, that the state of the nation uh, the expectation or, or the, actually the imminent necessity is that we know what's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, what is this basic income grant going to look like or something similar? Um, the idea that it looks different this year from next year to next year, that is certainly an option on the table. Yeah. We need to know how it's being spent, who it's being targeted to, and also where the money is going to come from. So I, Lots I, of I, options. I, so I, with I, I, is this, can we attribute this to poor support of... Uh, uh, the businesses in this sector and therefore what we would look at as a line item in the budget speech would be w what kind of support will be given to these businesses? Well, I mean, it, it's a case of I, I don't think money will be flowing directly from government to businesses. Government already supports small business through its procurement of goods and services. Uh, so it's, it's not a case of government not doing their part to help support small businesses and micro businesses. I think the focus here is on on getting money directly into the pockets of people that will be spending this at a business, small business, spaza shop, for example, or be, they will be using this money to fund their own small little business, creating their own job. Uh, so I think government would, in this case, be putting the responsibility of this uh, spending and those multiply effects with the South Africans who know their communities best, those people that understand how their village works, yeah. how their little corner of the country actually works, right. and where there can be opportunities to actually spend that money and have a meaningful impact. All right. So yeah, let's, let's bring you in, particularly on that point, right? We are likely going to be hearing Treasury saying we are going to be spending so much, or we have already been spending so much in, in support of uh, small and medium-sized businesses or, or entrepreneurs. What, what are we doing wrong there? Uh, because if, if, if all these years we keep saying we are spending money and we are supporting these, these uh, businesses in, in the townships and, and so on and so forth, but we are not seeing the results of, of those businesses beginning to employ people, surely there's something that we're not doing correctly. Um, so that's, 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 a very, that's also a very huge problem um, um, to look at. I mean, for me, I could uh, speak on the issue of cooperatives and how cooperatives, they've been saying they're failing, um, but there's been um, a lack to monitor and, 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 and train people who, 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 um, who operate in, in cooperatives. Um, there's, there's been a, a, some sort of, if you say, um, a, a reckless support of it, um, because they look cooperatives as as part of an SMME, while cooperatives are not that. Cooperatives, and people understand cooperatives as part of solidarity economies and communities working together. Um, and they should not, they should be separated from um, being looked at as SMMEs. And I think that's one of the problems. Um, but I don't think the support for them is enough. Um, the support, it goes to big business. I mean, if you look at the tax that is being taxed, um, there's been an increase in the, in the, in the, in, 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 in the taxation of, of big business. I mean, they've been receiving tax holidays. They've been receiving, um, I mean, if you look at also exchange control, it, they've been loosened. So, and we need to shift that. We need to shift the focus to the people. Um, we need a people-centered budget, um, a budget that would look at Solidarities in, in economy, in solidarity economies and communities as part 
of, of the economy. And I mean, we've seen during the unemployment stats that people are practicing, informal sector is doing great because people, they've seen that as an option, as an option to all corporates. You support that. We've seen the rise and, and the importance of stock sales in this, in this process. Then find a way to, 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 to support that. And I want to go to the point, and this is a very dangerous point that we're facing in South Africa. Um, and, you know, the issue of po policing and, 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 and the employment fee, people yeah. who've died, even in the health sector, yeah. um, have, have been frozen. So that speaks to the privatization of, of, of the public sector. Everything is being privatized, and we need to govern it to stop that. I appreciate you all. We're completely out of time. And thank you very much uh, for coming through and your patience tonight uh, with all our challenges here as a fryer, as Yavle Mama, as well as Dr. Christy Fadun. We lost uh, Parabile Rubi there uh, mid-conversation.